This program is brought to you in part by the Paul B. Hunter and Constance D. Hunter Charitable Foundation, Incorporated, a proud partner of WUCF-TV and the Central Florida community. Welcome to this episode of Central Florida Road Trip. I'm your host, Dr. Phil Hoffman. You know, whether it's by land, sea, or air, our Central Florida area has played a key role in our nation's military history. Join us now as we take a look through the past and how the military has impacted Central Florida. World War II comes to Florida before Pearl Harbor. People don't realize this. There are two things going on. One is the presence of U-boats off the Florida coast. And number two is pilot training. As they researched the country, they actually found that Orlando and Central Florida had 360 good flying days per year, making it one of the best training grounds in the country with that many good flying days typically. So it was decided to start to place a lot of training here for pilots. One of those places that was selected was the Orlando Municipal Airport, which became Orlando Army Air Base in 1941. It was a huge area. It includes today Fashion Square Mall, all the way down Colonial, it's that huge swath of land. What's interesting about it, it was, it of course served as a training center to thousands of pilots, but of course we were concerned that we may get attacked along the East Coast by the Germans, or maybe the Japanese would even find their way around, and the runways and all of the taxiways and everything were painted out to look like citrus grove from above. So they were painted green with orange dots and such so Orlando Army Air Force Base actually looked like a citrus grove from above. Now I think if you look closely you might be able to see a few of the little taxiways or runoff spots even today have a little bit of that painting and markings on them. Pinecastle Air Force Base, which was built in 1943 as Pinecastle Army Air Base. That was for the big bombers. Then the military used it during the Korean conflict, and then they used it also during the Cuban Missile Crisis. People don't realize that Orlando was a major line in the Cuban threat during the Cuban Missile Crisis, that thousands of people were stationed here in case there was a need for a military response. The only death during the Cuban Missile Crisis was a pilot who was shot down over Cuba. He was flying out of Orlando to spy on the Russian military presence in Cuba. Pine Castle remains open for the Vietnam War. Lots of training going on here, lots of planes coming in and out. Then gradually the Vietnam War begins to wind down. By 73, the Defense Department starts making up a list of bases that can be closed, and Pine Castle is one of them, and it finally closes in 1975. Pine Castle Air Force Base was renamed McCoy Air Force Base in 1958 in honor of Colonel Michael McCoy, whose heroic deed possibly saved the lives of thousands. Colonel McCoy was the base commander at Pine Castle Air Force Base in the early and mid-1950s, and he was, of course, a pilot. And one day he took up a bomber just as a training mission, and unfortunately the bomber had some problems as it was in the air. He did a very good job of directing the plane away from any populated areas and crashed it over in the direction of Pine Hills, but away from any built-up areas. He became a hero. The Air Force Base was named after him, McCoy Air Force Base. There's an elementary school named for him out there near the airport. And the airport at first was known as McCoy Airport. Then it became Orlando International Airport, but your luggage tag still to this day says MCO on it, and the official designation by the FAA is MCO after Michael McCoy. Naval Air Station Sanford was extremely important in World War II. Very quickly we had young men from all over the country being brought in here to train to fly in the Pacific. 
in the 40s in World War II, half of the fighter pilots trained here at NES Sanford. In the Navy circle, this base was called the best kept secret because everybody loved being stationed here because the town supported the Navy personnel here. So everybody loved being stationed here. When the war ended, the Navy closed it for the time being. And the New York Giants arrived and said, we'd really like to use that space for a spring training for our minor league teams. So at one point in the late 40s, we had the largest spring training camp for minor league in the country because they had this whole Naval Air Station to use for their ball fields. Well, that was fine until we went to Korea. So in 1951, the Navy informed the Giants that they had 30 days to get off of the station because they were coming back. And as the 50s went on, it transitioned into a Cold War base and it became a reconnaissance and intelligence gathering station. For that reason, when the base was still here in Vietnam, we had a high proportion of the POWs, people who were shot down over North Vietnam, were from our station because they were gathering intelligence in an unarmed plane. So the station was here through most of Vietnam. It closed in 69. They moved their operations to Albany, Georgia. World War II impacted Brevard County and, and the Cocoa Beach area like it did much of the state. People had to black out their windows along the coast because there were German submarines patrolling up and down the coast of Florida. Consequently, there were a lot of ships sunk because the U-boats would sit off the coast and just wait for the silhouette of uh, American ships, freighters and such, to go past Daytona Beach lit up, for example, and just go ahead and torpedo them. People aren't often aware that there was that much activity right here on, on American soil. The war is actually very important for the development of Cocoa Beach in that Patrick Air Force Base, which was at that time the Banana River Naval Air Station, was founded to the south of the community. So that meant that with the development of any military base as we saw in the Second World War, there's always development in the surrounding communities. So Cocoa Beach did grow during the Second World War. Before the war, there were eight military bases in Florida. Eight. By the end of the war, there are 172. John Kennedy trained here in Florida. The first President Bush trained here in Florida. It is a huge training area for millions of soldiers. During World War II, much of the population was in the military, and that opened the door for an unlikely group of employees. One of the most unusual aspects of the war, I think, is Nazi prisoners of war. When we captured Nazi prisoners, we couldn't leave them in the desert. There was no place to take them in Europe, which was controlled by Germany. England was already about to sink with so many people. So we decided to bring them back to the United States, over 130,000 German POWs. The easiest prisoner of war camps to set up were here in Florida. You didn't need heat. There was no air conditioning, so you could just throw up a barracks and put some barbed wire around it, and you had a prisoner of war camp. So we began bringing thousands of POWs, 12,000 in all, to Florida. Uh, 800 of them were housed at what's now Orlando International Airport. Prisoner of war camps were also set up in Winter Garden and in Lake County. Of course, we needed labor. The United States needed labor. So many men were sent to fight the wars in the Pacific and the European theater. And so the POWs also accomplished that. And German POWs, indeed, were used in agriculture throughout this country, including here. If you were in downtown Orlando, you might on the street see a guy in a Nazi prisoner of war uniform on his way to work in the factories. And at the end of the war, a number of them asked if they could remain here in Orlando. During World War II, much of Central Florida was focused on aviation. But in DeLand, one of the military's unsung heroes was chugging along. We got involved in building United States Army tugboats built on Lake Beersford during World War II and slightly thereafter. They built a total of 42 all-steel tugboats 29 during the war were completed, and of that 29, we know for a fact that 16 of them actually went to Germany. We even found later on that one of the World War II boats ended up in Korea, and four 
of the last run built in 1953 ended up in Vietnam. So our tugboat served three wars. As the tugboats made their way around the world, the land remained the perfect place to build. They wanted to choose a site that was on the St. John's River and the land was perfect and it also had a good workforce. They ended up having about 500 people, welders, uh, plumbers, pipe fitters, working at what we call the Beersford Boat Works during World War II and later. They knew if they built them on Lake Beersford, they could float them up to Jacksonville without the engine being installed. And once it was there, they could install the engine, the tugboat would go down into the water another two feet, and then they could turn them over to the U.S. Army from that point, which is exactly what they did. The tug served in many ways, but the boat's resilience is really what set them apart. The tugboats could push an ammo barge in like they did at Normandy. They could tow stuff up to intracoastal. They could save lives. They mounted machine guns during wartime and shot down airplanes. The tugboats were everything to everybody, and they knew that they had to have them. Baldwin Park is known as one of Orlando's most desirable neighborhoods, but back before there was a Baldwin Park, it was home to a giant Navy training ground. The Naval Training Center ended up here in part because the Air Force did not really need the extra land that it had with McCoy just down the way, and the Navy needed space for additional training. In 1968, the Naval Training Center moves here from Bainbridge, Maryland. It was a political deal. Martin Anderson, the publisher and owner of the Orlando Sentinel, was a close personal friend of Lyndon Johnson's. Anderson always touted him in the editorial pages, and Johnson owed him. Basically, Johnson said, is there anything you want? And he said, I'd like a Naval Training Center. It was unique in that it is, of course, an inland <laughs> naval training center, and there was actually a commissioned ship on the site named the Blue Jacket that all of the naval personnel trained on. And it was one of the very few naval vessels ever commissioned that was completely landlocked. The naval training center at its height employs 6,000 people. From 1941, until the coming of Disney, the military is the largest employer in Orlando. The Naval Training Center for 30 years trained more than 650,000 men and women to begin their careers as sailors. So the entire Baldwin Park area was an immense city that was at its peak getting about a thousand recruits a week. So it was a huge economic engine and a huge part of the culture of Orlando. Life inside the fences, I thought, was terrific. Now, if you were in boot camp, you probably had a different opinion because it was very structured and restricted. But it was a tremendous environment, just a great place to be assigned and to work. You knew you were doing important work for the Navy because, again, the people that you were working with, that we were training, were going to go out and be the next generation of sailors who were going to lead the fleet into the future. Life at the time basically you didn't have one. The whole thing is geared to stripping down yourself as an individual and becoming part of a cog in a machine. Eight weeks is a pretty grueling time when you have to get up every day and go through the motions to make your company commanders not yell at you. And that's one of the things about any military service really is, is it, it takes a person and makes them part of something that is just, it's indescribable. I went to boot camp here in the summer of 1973. And then I returned here in 1987 as a company commander, and I pushed recruits through boot camp for three years. I always tell people that was the most rewarding job I've ever had in my entire life. Because every morning I came in and I saw a difference. It was, it was incredible. Every morning when you came in, they were, they were different, they were changed. In the 70s when the Navy was, uh, well really all the culture was changing to be more inclusive of women. Of the three boot camps that were in operation at the time, Orlando was chosen as the first co-ed boot camp. 
I was one of the 188,000 women who graduated from Orlando RTC boot camp. Went through with 78 other women in my company. It was very difficult to go through boot camp very, very physically and mentally. So um, I think we just, you know, in our camaraderie, you know, you didn't do it alone. You did it as a group. I felt welcomed and respected and appreciated. I think that people were ready to have the Navy integrated and educating them to serve out in the fleet. For so many years, the things we did out in the community, every weekend we would send literally hundreds of sailors out to do service projects, whether it was reading to children in schools in the inner city or it was planting trees along the highways. There were so many community endeavors and projects that the Navy supported. The, the figures on blood donations alone were overpowering. The blood mobile, the big red bus, used to come twice a week and they'd arrive at 7 o'clock in the morning and the line would start at 7 o'clock in the morning and go till 5 o'clock in the afternoon when they left. We used to give Vampire Liberty, where if you gave a pint of blood, the people on the big red bus would give you a, a chit, a piece of paper, and the guy would have a day off. I think 10% of all the blood donations, if I have the figure correct, in the Central Florida area came out of that Navy base. When the base closed, I'm sure that had a major impact on the Central Florida's blood supply. I think it's it's tremendous thing that we are preserving that history. So many people remember when they had graduation at RTC every Friday and they fired the saluting batteries to honor the dignitaries. You know, car alarms would go off all over the area and r windows would rattle and people remember that, you know, even if they weren't in the Navy, but they knew it was part of the community. So the ability to, to keep that heritage in the form of these statues and recognition in the park is just a tremendous thing because we can't forget that heritage. I was asked if I would consider being the model for the woman statue. I'll never forget that day in July 2015 meeting Don Reynolds at Blue Jacket Park and standing on that pier in my Navy uniform holding that Navy cutlass and I just felt so, I felt so proud. That was, uh, that was a day I'll never forget. It makes me proud of the Orlando community that they would w be willing to recognize their history and recognize the men and women that served here, all the history. Even as history has changed that piece of ground, it's important to remember what was there and, and reflect on it sometimes. There are many amazing veterans who live in Central Florida, but the accomplishments of Colonel Joe Kittinger are really out of this world. When I was a young lad, uh, that was my goal, was to fly airplanes. I became enthralled with uh, flying, and uh, I read everything I could and built model airplanes, and uh, I would get on my bicycle and ride out to uh, Orlando Airport and watch the airplanes fly, and uh, it was just my goal that I set when I was very young and uh, never gave up on, on that goal. The Air Force accepted me and I went to flying training and from the rest of history from that. Commander of our fighter group, uh, test group at uh, Holloman called all the fighter pilots together and he said, I'm looking for a volunteer for a project for Dr. Stapp called Zero Gravity. And I immediately put my hand up and I looked around and I was the only one that had my hand up. And I wondered, what, what have I done? But Dr. Stapp was a visionary and he knew we were going to go into space and he knew there was certain information that we needed to do before we could go into space. In 1959, Kittinger joined Project Excelsior, a project to test high altitude space jumps. Using a lightweight balloon, Kittinger floated to 76,000 feet and jumped. But a problem arose when he got tangled in one of his parachutes. Very shortly after that, I became unconscious because of the spinning. And by the grace of God, at about 10,000 feet, my emergency parachute opened and saved my life. Well, it was a very close call, but this jump demonstrated why we were there. This jump demonstrated that without stabilization, 
a pilot is going to end up spinning violently. It was a close call, but a month later I went back, corrected the problem, and made a perfect jump from 76,000 feet uh, without any problems at all. On August 16, 1960, Kittinger took off again and set a high altitude record, jumping from 100,280 feet. I, and I felt like I wasn't falling at all because there's no sensation of speed. And I rolled over my back and I looked and there was a balloon flying into space. Actually, the balloon was standing still and I was going down at a very, very fast rate. After about 17 seconds, after I jumped, the small drogue chute opened, deployed perfectly, and uh, kept me stable all the way down. And at about 14,000 feet, uh, the main parachute opened. Everything worked according to plan. Uh, I landed in the desert, and uh, my crew was there immediately. And we were just elated. We were euphoric. It was, we were so happy that we had accomplished something that, that people said we could be done. Kittinger's jumps provided valuable information to NASA, but after turning down the opportunity to be an astronaut, he continued his career as a fighter pilot. So I went to Vietnam in 1963-64, then I went back in 1966-67, and then I went back in 1970-71. And when I went back in 71, uh, I was the squadron commander of an F-4 fighter squadron. No squadron will ever shoot down as many airplanes as we did. On the 1st of March in 1972, I shot down a MiG-21 in combat. And then a couple months later on the 11th of May, the world's greatest fighter pilot on the other side shot me down. I was captured immediately. I was taken to the Hanoi Hilton and I spent 11 months there uh, as a POW. Kittinger's distinguished career speaks for itself and his passion for veterans and aviation is now an Orlando landmark. Several years ago, I had this thought that we'll do something to recognize the Vietnam veterans. So I came up with the idea of putting up an F-4 on a pedestal and with the aid of, of 60 local Central Florida companies and the donations from over 200 people, we put up a beautiful F-4D on my park down there off 408 as a tribute to the Vietnam veterans. And that's what it's there for. I had, I had a wonderful career in the Air Force, 29 years flying airplanes and balloons, and uh, I had the, the best job in the whole world. About 15 miles east of Colonel Joe Kittinger Park is the Corporal Larry E. Smedley National Vietnam War Museum, a museum dedicated to those who served and named for a true American hero. Larry Smedley was a squad leader of a Marine rifle squad that was assigned an ambush position in a place called Happy Valley. A hundred NVA came along with rockets intending to rocket Da Nang. Larry's squad of seven Marines ambushed that larger enemy force and then attacked them as they were retreating. A machine gun opened up on Larry's squad. Larry assaulted that machine gun single-handedly with a grenade, destroyed it, although he was killed by that machine gun. Corporal Smedley was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, the military's highest honor. It saved members of his squad. It saved the lives of people who were in Da Nang at that time that never know to this day that a rocket might have fallen on them, but not for Larry Smedley, a boy from Orange County, Florida. How many people do you know that will charge right into a machine gun that's firing at them, run right up to it and drop a grenade on it? Corporal Smedley has been honored several ways in Central Florida, a section of the I-4 interstate and a memorial plaque at the Orange County Courthouse all bear his name. I have to tell you, it's an eerie feeling. And walking past that and remembering being an 18-year-old Marine serving with Larry Smedley in Vietnam and remembering the battle that that, you know, that's described on that plaque. What I think when I see that picture is that of all the years that I've had since the time that I was 18 and that he has not had, I regret that Larry Smedley didn't have a chance to do the things that I've done in life, to grow old. Raise your hand. Arms. It brings back sad memories, maybe when I'm with myself in a, in a museum, 
but around folks and everything, it's like a catharsis. It brings back the fond memories of my service. And now I can honestly say I'm, I was proud of my service. Proud that I volunteered. Proud that I went over there. I'm down in Florida visiting family and friends, and every time I come to this part of Florida, I always make it a point to come and see. Reminisce brings back memories, you know. It's like a healing process for me. You see things, you remember it, then you move on. It's very interesting watching the veterans come in. It's bringing back memories. Some, some of the veterans can't take it. Some of the veterans won't come into music. I think it's important that this community knows about Larry Smedley and, and his sacrifice. I think well, it, it, it's most important that the young people in this community know about that sacrifice, that they understand that people their age, if they're 18, Larry Smedley was 18 years old when he died in Vietnam. This museum represents the 58,000 who lost their lives over there, brothers and sisters, and it, it needs to be relevant, it needs to be remembered. That's it for this episode of Central Florida Road Trip. I'm your host, Dr. Phil Hoffman. Join us next time as we continue to explore the rich history that surrounds us every day right here in Central Florida. This program is brought to you in part by the Paul B. Hunter and Constance D. Hunter Charitable Foundation, Incorporated a proud partner of WUCF-TV and the Central Florida community.